Is there such a thing as converting to Daoism? In relatively recent times, Daoism has attracted increasing interest among people outside China. A quick scan of internet sites affords a fair impression of contemporary Euro-American interpretations of the ancient Chinese tradition. Many non-Chinese who are attracted to Daoism gravitate toward the philosophical rather than to the theistic or religious elements. Some proponents of New Age beliefs have adopted the use of deist divinatory techniques. Especially the interpretation of the hexagrams by consulting the Yijing. But on the whole, non-Chinese who express an active interest in Daoism do not convert to the tradition the way one would when becoming, say, a Muslim or a Christian. Since Daoism is so intertwined with an integrated worldview that is profoundly Chinese, it is almost a contradiction in terms to talk of becoming a Daoist. Do Buddhists believe in angels? Buddhist popular belief inherited and retained many of the different types of celestial and semi-divine beings that populated Hindu myth. Nearly all Hindu deities have their personal attendants. In addition, a variety of other spiritual presences fill the heavenly and earthly realms. Artists often depict these characters as floating gracefully. But they generally lack the wings most people associate with angels. A class of being called Apsaras, Sanskrit for moving in water, are the most numerous of these denizens of the intermediate realm. Early Buddhist artists sometimes depicted Apsaras as devotees worshipping. The Buddha's footprints were gathered around the Tree of Enlightenment. Another group, called the Gandharvas, were Hindu demigods who entertained the deities as musicians and dancers. Buddhist tradition retained them in that capacity. The classic angelic function of guardianship and protection resides in other classes of beings regarded as gods in some sects. Lokapalas, world guardians, are those who stand watch over the four quarters of the universe. Many Buddhist temples depict them as muscular, heavily armed gatekeepers. The Dharmapalas, guardians of the teaching are a band of fearsome deities whose task is to guard believers, especially in Vajrayana. As a kind of personal deity assigned to each individual, these protectors can take on either benevolent or angry form. Depending on whether they are dealing with a believer or with an enemy of the faith. What kind of religious calendar do Buddhists observe? Since Buddhism has long been identified with so many different cultural settings, there is some variation in the ways Buddhists keep track of sacred times. The basic religious calendar remains tied, at least nominally, to the ancient Hindu combination of lunar and solar reckoning. 
but many Buddhists now observe some festivities on fixed dates. The earliest Buddhists apparently did not concern themselves with marking special occurrences on their calendar. But within a generation or so, India's growing and spreading Buddhist communities began to incorporate religious social occasions into ordinary life. As Buddhist communities arose outside of India they naturally tended to blend religious observances imported by Buddhist missionaries with the indigenous festivities of the land. In most places where Buddhism is an important presence today, the reckoning of years begins with the date of the Buddha's entry into Nirvana, which coincided with his death. In any given year, Buddhists observe various special occasions. Some commemorate major events in the life of the Buddha. Others celebrate different institutional features of the tradition, others are tied to seasonal festivities. And still others are linked to special events only in certain countries. What about ordinary people incapable of such lofty feats? They can still hope to receive an immortal body after resurrection. A belief with some similarity to classic Christian notions of bodily resurrection. Another important distinction between deist notions of salvation and, for example, Christian beliefs, is that there is no single savior figure in deist thought. Are dreams and visions important to Buddhist tradition? Important figures in Buddhist tradition are said to have learned essential truths through dreams and visions. Queen Maya dreamed that she would give birth under unusual circumstances to a child who would become the Buddha. In dreams famous people learn of the proper course of action. Buddhist sources tell, for example, of how a dream persuaded the Chinese Emperor Ming Di to send for Buddhist missionaries and scriptures. Stories of this sort are told about many holy persons throughout Buddhist history. Usually as a vehicle for underscoring the individual's personal authority. Accounts of dreams and visions are by no means uniquely Buddhist, of course. And tell us more about the tone and feel of popular Buddhist lore than about the tradition's central teachings. Visionary meditative techniques, a different matter altogether, are of great importance in some Mahayana schools. Esoteric schools, such as those of Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism. Use mandalas as visual aids in complicated techniques for creating mental images. The meditator generates a visionary world patterned on the mandala, in which the divine and the human interact and all distinctions vanish. Simpler visualization techniques are used in the more popular Pure Land tradition as well. Facing west, the meditator visualizes the sun setting, and water turning into ice. Gradually, the mind fills with images of a golden land with crystalline streams. Lotus-filled lakes with golden bottoms, and shores of diamond sand. 
as the pure land, with its myriad jeweled palaces, takes shape in the mind's eye. The meditator sees the Buddha Amitbha and his attendant Bodhisattvas. At length the meditator visualizes himself being reborn into that happy land enfolded in a lotus flower. What is the relationship between Daoism and nature? According to Daoist tradition, all things naturally exist in a primordial harmony. When things go wrong, whether in nature or in human society, the cause is invariably an imbalance in the equilibrium of yin and yang that results in a blockage of the flow of natural energies. Qi. Part of the problem is the human tendency to seek control. When that desire leads to ill-conceived attempts to dominate nature, the outcome can only be disastrous. Nature yields its abundance easily and graciously to all among the ten thousand things. Creatures, that are willing to receive without grabbing or hoarding. When human beings develop a warped notion of their place in the larger scheme of things. Attempting to force their will, all of nature may suffer temporary setbacks. But in the end, nature's balance will return. Traditional Chinese landscape paintings say it much better than words can. Massive mountains loom in the upper part of a hanging scroll, their craggy peaks bathed in sunlight. From the heights a waterfall cascades into the valley below. Forming a lake as the stream emerges into the plain. Tucked away in a mountain scene, a tiny human figure sits meditatively in a picturesque pavilion. Further below, an unobtrusive figure shoulders a load across a small bridge. A solitary fisherman drops a line from his slender craft. Between valley and peaks, or perhaps where the peak imperceptibly becomes valley. Hangs a misty cloud of that cosmic force known as Qi. Landscape paintings. Called mountain water pictures, thus suggest the perfect balance between yang and yin. What are the ten paramitas, great virtues, of the Bodhisattva? The following ten virtues are to be attained after continuing efforts in numerous past lives as Buddha to be. Charity, morality, renunciation, wisdom, effort, patience, truth, determination, universal love, equanimity. Is salvation an important concept for deists? Some elements in deist tradition discuss at length the type of salvation from mortality itself. That is quite different from the kind of salvation Muslims and Christians look forward to. Something closer to salvation in spite of mortality. For deists, the most spiritually accomplished individuals are capable of so purifying themselves that they can actually live on eternally in the paradise of immortals. They might appear to die and be buried, but only because they allowed that to happen as a concession to widespread belief and socially acceptable convention. In fact they are able to substitute something else for their body and to slip away to paradise unnoticed.
Have there been important Buddhist mystics? If transforming encounter with mystery and the cultivation of mental and spiritual states beyond. Everyday awareness counts as mysticism, then Buddhist tradition can certainly claim its mystics. But there are important differences between Buddhist mysticism and those of traditions such as Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity. All three of those traditions talk of at least two large categories of extraordinary spiritual experience. In theistic or dualistic mystical experience. The human person meets the divine other but retains his or her individuality. In monistic or cosmic mysticism, the human person becomes one with or realizes the oneness that already exists in, an ultimate reality, with no trace of individuality surviving. Buddhist teaching insists that there is no self to begin with, so neither of those two models quite fits. True, some Buddhist schools use the language and symbolism of deity and union. But they understand those symbols as meditative aids rather than representations of metaphysical realities. Have there been any other sub communities or denominations within Daoism? Dozens of other schools and sects have arisen over the long history of religious Daoism. The Great Purity School, Shangqing, also known as Mount Mao. Mao Shan, Daoism, arose during the late 4th century. The Shangqing claims as its central revelation a set of scriptural texts in over 30 volumes. Almost contemporary in origin with that school is another called the Lingbo. It also claims a distinctive scriptural revelation, based in part on the Shangqing scripture. Heavenly Mind, Tian Xian, Daoism, emphasizing the importance of exorcism and based also on its own scriptural revelation, began in the late 10th century. The Divine Highest Heaven, Shen Xiao, school, dating from the 12th century, is best known for its talismans of legendary potency and its elucidation of correspondences between the microcosm of the body and the macrocosm of the universe. Great Oneness, Tai Yi, Daoism, also from the 12th century was a celibate monastic school important for its integration of Confucian and Buddhist elements. Though none of these schools remains active today. All have made significant historical contributions to the large and complex reality called Daoism. What about lesser or subordinate popular deities? Associated with Ma Ziu is the great emperor protecting life, Bao Sheng Da Di. A physician during medieval, Song Dynasty, times, he remains a popular healing power. Legend says that he suffered from unrequited love for Ma Ziu. Shao Lao, god of longevity, appears often in Chinese art and in temple decorations. He holds a peach and a staff, walks with a crane or a deer or both. 
and has an exceptionally high forehead and a long white beard. Another god of longevity. Xiao Xing, has the responsibility of appointing each person's time of death. Like Xiao Lao, he holds a peach, but Xiao Xing's companions are the stag and bat. He is sometimes depicted as one of a trinity of star gods of happiness. Dozens of other lesser gods fill out the popular pantheon. Deng Fang Shuo is the divine patron of metalsmiths. Connected with the planet Venus and depicted standing on gold and silver ingots. Bian Ho is the patron deity of jewelers. Si Ming, a deity of deist origin, became the kitchen god, or director of destinies. Who oversees the fates of family members and submits reports annually to the Jade Emperor on how each person is progressing. Depicted as an elderly Mandarin, this household deity rules from his place above the family hearth. Who are some of the chief deist deities? Bearing in mind that it is not always possible to draw neat distinctions between deist divinities and those of CCT. Here are some of the figures that appear to have at least originated in deist circles. They are called the earlier heaven deities. At the top of the pantheon are the three pure ones, San Cheng. They seem to have been Daoism's theological rejoinder to the Buddhist. Groupings in which Bodhisattvas flank Amitbha Buddha to form a celestial triad. The three pure ones, or sacred beings, are named after the heavens in which they dwell. The heavens of the Jade, Higher, and Great Purity, respectively. This triad evidently developed out of a trio of deified human beings of history or legend. Lao Zi, known as Tian Shang Lao Jun, Lord of the Deist Teaching, was the first so elevated. Later a deity called Heavenly Venerable of the Original Beginning. Yuan Shi Tianzun, was named as Chief Deity. And still later a third deity, Grand Lord of the Dao, Tai Shang Dao Jun. Leapfrogged the two others to the top of the triad. These three, often depicted as enthroned elders, came to be identified with the more transcendent and abstract pure ones. Many consider the deified Lao Zi still a separate deity who ranks above the three pure ones. The Jade Emperor, Yu Huang Da Di, was eventually identified either as the chief deity's younger brother or as an incarnation of the Lord of the Heaven of Great Purity, and became the prominent deity in some CCT cults. According to one theological model, the three pure ones are manifestations of the primordial cosmic energy, Qi. Are there any deist holy places? Mountains are the most prominent of Daoism's sacred sites. But they were sacred to the Chinese long before Daoism. Four mountains marked the cardinal directions of ancient Chinese symbolic geography. And a fifth was eventually added at the center. 
perhaps in connection with the notion of five elements, earth, air, water, fire, and metal. Each mountain has its chief deity who discharges his own distinctive duties. A number of individual mountains in addition to the main five also possess special properties and are connected with particular deities or deist sects and schools. Mount Heming, Sichuan Province, is famed as the place where Zhang Daoling inaugurated religious Daoism. Deists share Mount Zhongnan, Shenzi Province, with Buddhists as a sacred site. The Celestial Masters School established its center on Mount Longhu, Kiangsi Province. Hundreds of Deist and Buddhist temples have stood on dozens of such sacred peaks. Two related features of Deist sacred geography are the system of 10 Great and 36 Lesser Grotto Heavens and 7 Taito Blessed Spots, some of which are located on famed mountains. These sites, mostly caves, are so designated because they are foci of sacred energy. They are often associated with religious figures believed to have found meditative solitude there and are likened to heavenly dwellings. What is the Deist Celestial Master's School and why is it important? Daoism Celestial Master's School, Tianxi Dao, also called Zhen Yi, correct one. Stands out as the original institutional expression of religious. Daoism and one of several early attempts to establish theocratic communities. It was originally known as the Five Bushels of Rice School. The dues expected of members, the Celestial Masters School. Founded by Zhang Daoling, 34 to 156 CE, in about 142, the sect focused initially on physical moral, and spiritual healing through ritual confession of faults and exorcism. Regular rituals included recitation from the Dao De Jing and communal meals. With special feasts three times annually to acknowledge the three celestial bureaucracies overseeing heaven, earth, and water. Over the centuries the Celestial Masters School has worked to prevent the popularization of religious rituals by attempting to maintain standards in the training of ritual specialists. Two main divisions, the Southern and Northern schools, developed more or less independently and then merged around the 14th century. After losing ground to various other schools for many centuries, the school has risen to prominence. In modern times and now generally dominates the formal practice of Daoism and its rituals. The school is represented officially by the 63rd master who lives in exile in Taiwan. So what happens in Buddhist mysticism? Some sources talk of realizing the emptiness of all things. Profound experience of the meaning of the Four Noble Truths transcends all ordinary levels of awareness. It is possible to attain nirvana in this life nirvana with the remainder. They call it and that means full insight into the way things are. One who arrives at such a state of objectless 
contemplation might justifiably be called a Buddhist mystic. Have there been any important Buddhist religious reformers? Many of the various Buddhist denominations and sects are the result of attempts at reform. Some people even regard the Buddha himself as one who sought to reform Hinduism. Among the best examples of religious reformers are those who aimed to rescue Buddhist teaching from complex formulas and make it accessible to real people. Tradition calls Bodhidharma. D532, the first patriarch of Chinese Zen. Apparently quite a colorful character. Bodhidharma criticized several schools for getting lost in their own long-winded treatises. Toss all the superfluous verbiage, he advised. And focus on direct Dharma transmission from master to student. About three centuries later in Japan, two other reformers set out to develop. Spiritual methods that would appeal to a broader public than some of the schools that had arrived in Japan during the previous several centuries. Kyokai, 744 to 835, and Seiko, 762 to 822, founded the Tendai and Shinjin lineages, respectively. But eventually Tendai turned more speculative and Shinjin more mystical and esoteric. Further reform developments eventually grew out of Tendai in the 12th and 13th centuries. A Tendai monk, Honan, 1133-1212, started a Japanese branch of Pure Land in hope of attracting people with its reliance on Amida Buddha. A successor named Nikiran, 1222-82, took Honan's insights a step further. Insisting that a devotee approaching in good faith had only to repeat the name of the scripture called the Lotus. Of the Good Law Sutra a mantra popular singer Tina Turner recommends to be assured of salvation. Where do members of local Daoist communities and members of CCT come together? By far the most important Daoist and CCT gathering places are local temples and shrines. As well as the elaborate but temporary altars set up in open spaces for the larger religious ceremonies. Temples vary in size and wealth and, naturally, the smaller the temple the more likely. It is to serve a purely ritual purpose and not to have room for other activities. Community temples at the center of towns and villages often serve as multi-purpose facilities. There might be any number of functions going on at one time classes for children. Play during recess, community meetings while worshippers attend to their devotional needs. In larger towns and cities, other organizations, such as various Daoist and Buddhist associations, apparently fill some of those communal functions as well. Most people still think of Daoist and CCT temples primarily as ritual facilities that also serve as centers of parish life. Temples typically govern their ordinary affairs through an elected committee. 
entrusted with all major decisions about ritual calendar, maintenance, and finance. Is there such a thing as a Buddhist saint? Nearly all of the Mahayana denominations look to special embodiments of holiness for guidance, inspiration, and even the occasional miracle. Japanese Buddhists call some of these figures shonen. An honorific designation bestowed especially on patriarchs and founders of lineages and denominations. A group called the 18 Lohans, Lohan is derived from the Sanskrit term Arhat. Are set apart from the Buddha's earliest disciples as uniquely sacred because of their unselfish commitment to spreading the Dharma rather than retire into peaceful solitude. Theravada tradition still uses the term Arhat, worthy one. To refer to a living embodiment of sanctity and wisdom. But the Arhat remains an ethical model only, and a rather distant ideal at that. Mahayana teaching sees the Bodhisattva as the ultimate in human potential. Some even confer the title on living individuals, such as the Dalai Lama. Bodhisattvas not only model spiritual perfection, but function as mediators as well. As emissaries of the various Buddhas. They exercise saving power and make comforting grace available to all who ask. Do people ever decide they want to depart from Daoism or CCT? Membership in Daoism and CCT has rarely, if ever, been a matter of exclusive allegiance. Members of some major religious traditions, such as Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and to a lesser degree, Hinduism, typically regard belonging as a kind of all-or-nothing affair. Either you're in, or you're out. Disagree with major tenets of the tradition. Or neglect consistently and willfully to fulfill the minimum ritual and ethical requirements. Of the faith community and your membership is in question or has lapsed altogether. Religiously involved Chinese generally do not think about membership in those terms. Belonging is deeply rooted in national and local culture, integral to the very fabric of society. Individuals who drift away from regular religious practice have not necessarily left. So long as they have not entirely cut themselves off from family and social connections. Other family members might express regret that sons or daughters no longer find the traditional ways helpful and have chosen to delete that part of their heritage from their self-identities. And many today sense the gradual diminishment of traditional values and practices precisely because of this sort of attrition. But Chinese, whether Deist or CCT, generally do not think in terms of leaving the faith. Unless they do so with the intention of converting to a missionary faith, such as Christianity. In those cases, people do talk of leaving behind unacceptable beliefs and practices. Are there any other important Deist sacred figures?
One important subordinate deity is Xian Tian Shang Di, Supreme Emperor of Dark Heaven. The Jade Emperor dispatched him to Earth to battle a band of renegade demon kings. His iconography shows him enthroned and using a serpent and a turtle leaders of the demons as a footstool. A legendary woman named Shi Wang Mu, also known as the Queen Mother of the West. Figures prominently in some deist writings. She is a patroness of immortality, often depicted in the company of jade maidens. One carrying a fan and the other a bushel of the peaches of longevity. Ruling the east is her divine consort, Dung Wan Gong. Who lives in the remote magical fastness of the Kunlun Mountains. In a reversal of the more usual dynamic, a god of walls and moats, also known as the city god. Began as a popular deity and made his way into the deist pantheon. During certain periods in history, the heavenly master appointed a given city's tutelary deity. City god has the assistance of several other figures. Called spirit secretaries, in the idiom of public administration. They help the city god deliver his reports on the conduct of citizens to the authorities in hell. A goddess named Domu, mother of the bushel of stars, or northern dipper. Functions in Daoism much the way Guanyin does in Buddhism, offering limitless compassion for the suffering. Some other potent beings are clustered in groups. The Sen Nin are a group of sacred figures who dwell in heaven or in the distant misty mountains. Among the Sen Nin the most important are the Eight Immortals. Originally persons either historical, three, or legendary. Five, they function as guardian figures of Daoism. Although they are not officially divine, popular lore sometimes attributes divine powers to them. They are called later heaven deities, as are all human figures who eventually achieved immortality. Who is the Bodhisattva Guan Yin? Next to the various Buddhas. Guan Yin is certainly one of the most important and popular sacred figures in Buddhist tradition. This Bodhisattva began life, mythically speaking. As a male guardian figure named Avalokiteshvara, the Lord who looks down. Known in China as Guan Yin and in Japan as Kanon, he was originally one of Varakana's. The central figure among the five transcendent Buddhas, attendants. Presiding over the cosmic northwest. Avalokiteshvara came to be particularly associated with compassion when paired with the Bodhisattva Manjushri, who represented wisdom. Boundless in his care for all, the compassionate one has appeared with multiple heads and arms one of the few bodhisattvas to be commonly so depicted. As Mahayana communities grew in China, Guanyin's perfect compassion gradually transformed him into a female bodhisattva. With a thousand arms and eleven heads, Guan Yin often has a decidedly feminine countenance. But she appears more often as a kindly woman smiling gently and inclined slightly toward her devotees. In more recent times people have begun to call her more ordinary human. 
manifestation the goddess of mercy, a convenient but misleading epithet that resulted from Buddhism's interaction with Chinese popular religious lore. In Japan, the thousand-armed, eleven-headed cannon often appears in multiple images within the same temple. Sometimes even as a life-sized sculpture. Popular lore claims that each cannon has a different face to symbolize. This bodhisattva's undivided attention to every single person on earth. Are there cyclical observances or feasts that occur regularly but not just once a year? During each lunar month, many Buddhists observe four special moon days called Aposatha. These are the full moon and new moon days, and days midway between them. Or the 1st, 8th, 15th, and 23rd of the month. Originally important as fast days in ancient Hindu practice, Buddhists now attach special ceremonies. To them some with the way Christians do to Sundays, Jews to Saturdays, and Muslims to Fridays. Lay Buddhists in some countries still regularly congregate in the local temple for a time of heightened religious discipline. Rituals include listening to a monk preach, meditating, and praying as monks chant the scriptures. Some devotees seek to gain spiritual merit by observing eight. Rather than the usual five, precepts during that day. Monastic life attaches special meaning to the new and full moon days. Monks assemble then to recite the rules of monastic discipline from a text called the Prati Moksha. They also engage in a communal confession of faults not unlike the traditional practice. Known as the chapter of faults in some Christian religious orders and monastic communities. After the monks recite each prohibition in the Prati Moksha, they pause to allow individuals to admit any transgression. Some Buddhists engage in fasting on new and full moon days. Emulating the monastic practice of taking no food between noon and breakfast the following day. How do Daoists view their traditions' relationships to other traditions? By the beginning of the first millennium, philosophically minded Daoists had rubbed elbows for several centuries with proponents of a cultural and ethical system often identified as Confucian. Together the Confucians and the Deists were increasingly important elements of a larger cultural matrix. Religion, for which they had as yet no specific term, was a blend of ancient divinatory rites. Ancestor veneration, exorcism, and offerings meant to secure blessings and protection from heaven and several other fairly generic and non-personal divine powers. Religious Taoism evolved during the period when Buddhism was taking root in China. It was not until Chinese Buddhism was several centuries old that Chinese thinkers began to talk of three ways of being both Chinese and religious. It is as though the Chinese people had not thought of their ancient traditions as anything but the way things are rather like the air they breathed. Until an imported form of thinking and acting called the way of the Buddha entered the scene. 
Buddhist-Deist relations have had a checkered history. At first many Deists regarded Buddhism as a new Deist school or sect. Thanks to Buddhist efforts at translating key concepts into terms Deists would understand. Before long, full-scale hostility developed when Deists began to think of the missionary-minded Buddhists as a threat. Confucians often sided with Deists in condemning Buddhism as un-Chinese. Periods of persecution of Buddhists alternated with rich interchange and mutual influence. Since the 1800s Deist-Buddhist relations have been much more stable and peaceful. So that many Chinese now perceive few or no important distinctions or barriers between the two traditions. CCT has been a kind of meeting ground. As for Deist Confucian relations, there has been intermittent rivalry for imperial patronage. The two traditions share a great deal in the way of broad doctrinal and cultural themes, such as the so called yin slash yang worldview and ancestor veneration. During the Confucian revival of the 12th and 13th centuries, a development often dubbed Neo Confucianism, there was renewed positive interaction and mutual exchange of ideas. Nowadays, relations remain generally cordial, but without much substantial discussion of core belief. Where do Deists live today? Are any estimates of numbers available? How about CCT? Until fairly recently, Deoism has been an almost exclusively Chinese phenomenon. Since the Maoist Revolution of 1949, Practice of Daoism in the People's Republic of China has diminished dramatically. Buddhism had the advantage of being an international tradition and thus of at least limited political utility. In addition, Buddhism qualified officially as a religion while Daoism was defined as mere superstition. Deist temples and monasteries were shut down or destroyed and thousands of Deist ritual specialists had to seek other means of livelihood. Things have taken a turn for the better since the 1980s. Monasteries have reopened, and as of 1995 counts. Deist temples number over 600 with about 10 times that number of nuns and priests. Some institutions have even managed to revive formal seminary training for ritual specialists. The Celestial Masters School and the Monastic Order of Chuanzhen. Complete Realization School, are the liveliest Deist organizations in the People's Republic now. Many hundreds of temples are active in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Many more belonging to CCT than to specifically Deist groups. Elsewhere in Asia, wherever significant populations of Chinese have gathered, such as Malaysia and Singapore, Deoism and CCT are growing but are still relatively small. Active Deists may number several million, while adherents of CCT may number between 100 and 200 million. These numbers seem relatively small next to counts of other major traditions. But they do not include the many millions of people whose days are full of ancient symbols and small rituals.
even if they are not formally identified with the institutional trappings of Daoism or CCT. Is the contemporary sect Falun Gong Daoist? Falun Gong, Dharma Will Cultivation, also called Falun De Fa, Dharma Will of the Buddha Way. Was founded in 1992 by Li Hongzhi and received official approval by China's Research Society of Qigong Science. Its principal symbol is a circle with a clockwise rotating swastika at its center. Around the central swastika are four Taiji symbols. At the cardinal directions, alternating with four more swastikas. The swastika is an ancient symbol of apparently South or Central Asian origin that has long been associated with both Hinduism and Buddhism. The iconographic significance of the various rotating symbols is related to the concept of chakras or energy centers, within the body. Within each person, therefore, resides a miniature of the whole spinning cosmos. This correspondence between the microcosm of the individual and the macro COSM of the universe is an important link to deist thought. Falun Gong advertises itself as an alternative to traditional religious traditions such as Daoism and Buddhism. And to practices such as Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan. Its spiritual leader, Li Hongzhi, says his purpose is to bring ancient wisdom again. Within reach of ordinary people who find the traditional systems no longer helpful. Drawing on Daoist imagery, Falun Gong's meditative method, combined with ritual movement, aims at helping practitioners to balance, maximize, and release their energies. Chinese authorities almost certainly had complex motives in attempting to suppress the sect in 1999. One concern may be the ancient connection religious Daoism had with messianic and revolutionary movements. What is the perfect realization school of Daoism? Founded by Wang Zhe C. 1123 to 1170, also called Wang Chong Yang, the perfect realization. Chuan Zhen, school is among the most important Daoist monastic orders. According to legend, Wang Zhe received new revelations from one of the eight immortals, Lu Dong Bin. Ascetic self-denial was a central feature in the order's discipline. Including meditative practices designed to maximize yang energy and minimize yin. The founder evidently insisted on the importance of studying the teachings of Buddhism and Confucianism along with those of Daoism. But focused on the characteristically Daoist spiritual goal of immortality. Of its several branches, the Lung Men, Dragon Gate, is perhaps the most influential. Like religious orders in some other major traditions. The perfect realization order historically has been socially active and responsible for preserving much traditional Chinese religious culture in times of turmoil. For example, they have done extensive refugee relief work and published a 
major edition of the Deist scriptural canon in 1192. From the White Cloud Monastery in Beijing. The Lungmen branch of the order continues its work today. Do Deists and practitioners of CCT believe in miracles? Devout Chinese, whether associated with Daoism or with some form of CCT. Consider asking for special favors an ordinary part of being religious. In general, however, what many readers mean by the term miraculous would not quite describe. Even apparently spectacular results of supplicatory prayer and ritual in this context. A fundamental consequence of the yin slash yang view of life is the conviction that there is an identifiable cause of everything, whether positive or negative. All evil, illness, and suffering is a result of disharmony and imbalance. It is true that ordinary people cannot always put their finger on the direct cause. But ritual specialists know about these things. More importantly, the gods and those spiritual beings who have found the secret of immortality can assist suffering humankind by bringing about needed balance and harmony of forces. A miracle in this context, therefore, might be a divine intervention not for the purpose of doing the impossible but for helping the possible to happen more quickly and easily. Is there a central teaching authority for Deists? Individual Deist sects, orders, and schools have regarded and in some cases still do regard their teaching office as a solemn and demanding role. But on the whole, deists do not think of themselves as following any particular teaching or adhering to a particular orthodoxy. Even when important patriarchs, such as the living leader of the Celestial Masters School, have delivered formal pronouncements, relatively few deists take notice. What is true of deoism in this respect is even truer of the much more amorphous CCT. In neither case is any specific articulation of doctrine of any particular importance. Doctrinal standards are replaced here by pure tradition the way we've always done things. Is there a central teaching authority for Deists? Individual Deist sects, orders, and schools have regarded and in some cases still do regard their teaching office as a solemn and demanding role. But on the whole, Deists do not think of themselves as following any particular teaching or adhering to a particular orthodoxy. Even when important patriarchs, such as the living leader of the Celestial Masters School, have delivered formal pronouncements, relatively few Deists take notice. What is true of Deoism in this respect is even truer of the much more amorphous CCT. In neither case is any specific articulation of doctrine of any particular importance. 
Doctrinal standards are replaced here by pure tradition dash the way we've always done things. Is there a system of deist religious law? Apart from the charters or disciplinary codes of deist organizations such as monastic orders, there is no such thing as formal deist religious law. The very idea goes against the grain of the concept of natural. Balance and harmony that is so central to deist thought. That is not to say that there aren't countless standard practices and expectations as to behavior. The difference between deism and, say, Islam or Christianity, in this respect is that the Muslim and Christian traditions have systematically codified those expectations while the deist has not. Every cultural and religious system has its standards and sanctions. But in the cases of both Islam and Christianity, independent legal systems became necessary largely because the religious traditions expanded into new cultural settings very different from those in which the traditions arose. In the case of Daoism, religion and culture have been much more closely and consistently identified. Making a separate system of religious law largely unnecessary. Is there a system of Daoist religious law? Apart from the charters or disciplinary codes of deist organizations such as monastic orders, there is no such thing as formal deist religious law. The very idea goes against the grain of the concept of natural balance and harmony that is so central to deist thought. That is not to say that there aren't countless standard practices and expectations as to behavior. The difference between Daoism and, say, Islam or Christianity, in this respect is that the Muslim and Christian traditions have systematically codified those expectations while the Daoist has not. Every cultural and religious system has its standards and sanctions. But in the cases of both Islam and Christianity, independent legal systems became necessary largely because the religious traditions expanded into new cultural settings very different from those in which the traditions arose. In the case of Daoism, religion and culture have been much more closely and consistently identified. Making a separate system of religious law largely unnecessary. What are some of the main varieties of deist officials or specialists? Since about the 4th century CE, religious specialists called Dao Shi, masters of the Dao, have led Daoist communities at prayer. These leaders can be celibate monks, there are also nuns called Daogu, who live almost exclusively in monastic communities. Monastic priests mostly members of the complete realization order occasionally perform public rituals. But, not unlike cloistered monks in some other traditions. 
their principal focus is on their more private spiritual pursuits. Some ritual specialists are married family men who live near a monastery. These so-called lay masters, Qigong, make up the majority of Daoist ritual specialists. Individuals generally specialize in certain types of ritual, such as exorcism and faith healing. Among the non-monastic, those ritualists whose functions most closely resemble those of priests in various other traditions are called the black hats. Many of them belong to the Celestial Masters School, perhaps the oldest of all Daoist organizations. In addition to the black hats, the official and intricately trained priests. There are the red turbans known as Fashi, specialists in the occult. Black hats, so called because of their small mandarin cap with a gold knob on top. Are authorized to perform both the greater festivals and the more ordinary ceremonies to which the red turbans are restricted. The two groups are alternatively known as blackheads and redheads. Specialists of earlier times called libationers in the Celestial Masters School had the triple duty of religious instruction, local administration, and ritual leadership. Not unlike the typical parish pastor in many Christian denominations. What are some of the main varieties of Daoist officials or specialists? Since about the 4th century CE, religious specialists called Dao Shi, masters of the Dao, have led Daoist communities at prayer. These leaders can be celibate monks, there are also nuns called Dao Gu, who live almost exclusively in monastic communities. Monastic priests mostly members of the complete realization order occasionally perform public rituals. But, not unlike cloistered monks in some other traditions. Their principal focus is on their more private spiritual pursuits. Some ritual specialists are married family men who live near a monastery. These so-called lay masters, Qigong, make up the majority of Daoist ritual specialists. Individuals generally specialize in certain types of ritual, such as exorcism and faith healing. Among the non-monastic, those ritualists whose functions most closely resemble those of priests in various other traditions are called the black hats. Many of them belong to the Celestial Masters School, perhaps the oldest of all Daoist organizations. In addition to the Black Hats, the official and intricately trained priests. There are the Red Turbans known as Fashi, specialists in the occult. Black Hats, so called because of their small mandarin cap with a gold knob on top are authorized to perform both the greater festivals and the more ordinary ceremonies to which the red turbans are restricted. The two groups are alternatively known as blackheads and redheads. Specialists of earlier times called libationers in the Celestial Masters School had the triple duty of religious instruction, local administration, and ritual leadership. Not unlike the typical parish pastor in many Christian denominations. Are there deist hierarchical structures?
since there are many different sects and schools. There are no official and universally acknowledged hierarchical structures that unite all deists. But there are de facto hierarchies both religious, within individual deist organizations. And social, based on a broader kind of class consciousness. For example, in the Celestial Master's School, the Living Heavenly Master functions as a sort of Archbishop. Overseeing the running of the school's temples in the region. Within the administration of the school, ranks are named after those of the imperial bureaucracy. Such as libationer, recorder, and director of ceremonies. The Celestial Master's School has retained much of its ancient hierarchical structure today. In addition, each of the various monastic orders is internally structured according to authority and leadership roles. With the equivalent of an abbot at the head. Hierarchical structures have also been very much a part of the several short-lived attempts to create theocratic states, but their claims to authority were naturally limited. Within their everyday lives, most deists would likely be aware only of the functional hierarchy inherent in the more elaborate ritual celebrations. There, a high priest presides. While subordinate priests perform much of the ceremonial action and musical accompaniment. Other non-ordained assistants busy themselves with the overall mechanics of the ritual. Keeping the action moving by making sure necessary supplies are plentiful and other practical matters are in order. Are there deist hierarchical structures? Since there are many different sects and schools. There are no official and universally acknowledged hierarchical structures that unite all deists. But there are de facto hierarchies both religious, within individual deist organizations. And social, based on a broader kind of class consciousness. For example, in the Celestial Master's School, the Living Heavenly Master functions as a sort of Archbishop. Overseeing the running of the school's temples in the region. Within the administration of the school, ranks are named after those of the imperial bureaucracy. Such as libationer, recorder, and director of ceremonies. The Celestial Master's School has retained much of its ancient hierarchical structure today. In addition, each of the various monastic orders is internally structured according to authority and leadership roles. With the equivalent of an abbot at the head. Hierarchical structures have also been very much a part of the several short-lived attempts to create theocratic states, but their claims to authority were naturally limited. Within their everyday lives, most deists would likely be aware only of the functional hierarchy inherent in the more elaborate ritual celebrations. There, a high priest presides. While subordinate priests perform much of the ceremonial action and musical accompaniment. Other non-ordained assistants busy themselves with the overall mechanics of the ritual. Keeping the action moving by making sure necessary supplies are plentiful and other practical matters are in order.
Have women exercised leadership among deists? One of the most famous libationers was a woman named Wei Hua Kun, 251-334 CE. Her rank as libationer apparently indicates that she originally belonged to the Celestial Masters School. Some regard her as a foundational figure in the Shangqing sect. She is perhaps most famous for having appeared posthumously on many nights over a six-year period to reveal to a certain Yangshi the sacred texts of the Shangqing sect. Those texts consist mainly of liturgical ritual. Throughout its long history, the Celestial Masters School has allowed women into the lower rungs of its ritual hierarchy. Up to but not including that of Celestial Master itself. Another school, called Pure Rarity, Ching Wei, is said to have been founded by a woman named Zia Xu in the early 10th century. Centered around a thunder deity, the sect blended elements from the Lingbao, Shangqing, and Celestial Masters schools. There have been many priestesses over the centuries. And a celibate community of women maintain a temple in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Hagiographical sources are extant on a number of holy women of ancient times. They make it clear that women who preferred to pursue the spiritual life rather than devote themselves to family risked almost certain disapproval. Even so, it seems that some women were associated with religious orders. Sun Buletin ER, 1119-1182, and her husband were both ritual specialists in the perfect realization order. And she founded a new division of the school dedicated to the religious education of women. A selection of her writings in translation is available in Thomas Cleary's Immortal Sisters. Secret Teachings of Taoist Women A sect associated especially with the Red Turbans is popularly called San Nai, Three Ladies. Evidently so named to honor a trio of priestesses about whom little else is known. As has often been the case in other religious traditions, many Chinese women have found possibilities for active leadership and ministry more often outside the institutional structures than within. Have women exercised leadership among deists? One of the most famous libationers was a woman named Wei Hua Kun, 251-334 CE. Her rank as libationer apparently indicates that she originally belonged to the Celestial Masters School. Some regard her as a foundational figure in the Shangqing sect. She is perhaps most famous for having appeared posthumously on many nights over a six-year period to reveal to a certain Yangshi the sacred texts of the Shangqing sect. Those texts consist mainly of liturgical ritual. Throughout its long history, the Celestial Masters School has allowed women into the lower rungs of its ritual hierarchy. Up to but not including that of Celestial Master itself. Another school, called Pure Rarity, Ching Wei, is said to have been founded by a woman named Xiaoxu in the early 10th century. 
centered around a thunder deity, the sect blended elements from the Lingbo. Shang Qing, and Celestial Masters Schools There have been many priestesses over the centuries. And a celibate community of women maintain a temple in Kao's Hung, Taiwan. Hagiographical sources are extant on a number of holy women of ancient times. They make it clear that women who preferred to pursue the spiritual life rather than devote themselves to family risked almost certain disapproval. Even so, it seems that some women were associated with religious orders. Sun Buletan ER, 1119-1182, and her husband were both ritual specialists in the perfect realization order. And she founded a new division of the school dedicated to the religious education of women. A selection of her writings in translation is available in Thomas Cleary's Immortal Sisters. Secret Teachings of Taoist Women A sect associated especially with the Red Turbans is popularly called San Nai, Three Ladies. Evidently so named to honor a trio of priestesses about whom little else is known. As has often been the case in other religious traditions, many Chinese women have found possibilities for active leadership and ministry more often outside the institutional structures than within. How are Daoist leaders chosen and given authority? Traditional Daoist priesthood has long been a hereditary occupation. Though that appears to be changing in recent times. This feature obviously applied consistently only to non-celibate branches of the priesthood. Individuals who successfully completed requisite initial training are ordained. Following general patterns similar to those of Buddhist monastic practice. Ordination requires a quorum of ordained priests, and the ordinand takes refuge in the Deo. The canon of scripture, and the tradition's spiritual teachers. Much as the Buddhist monk takes refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Lay specialists, whether black hats or red turbans. Apprentice to an authoritative master called a Deo Jang, perhaps the equivalent of high priest. His task is to lead novices through several levels of ritual assistantship. Students begin with basic musical accompaniment. Learn to watch over the incense burners, and lead group prayers. More difficult training includes learning to chant and memorizing often intricate rubrics. Ritual Movements After learning to copy sacred texts and write talismans calligraphically, aspirants are ready to lead ritual. In the People's Republic of China some seminaries still provide formal doctrinal instruction. But that is generally not the case in Taiwan. Formal ordination focuses on the symbolism of the master conferring. The seal of priesthood and the texts the specialist will follow. Some scholars suggest the training of black hats is more rigorous and literate than that of the red turbans. Who tend to serve less official, more popular functions and have much in common with the shamans of old.
How are Daoist leaders chosen and given authority? Traditional Daoist priesthood has long been a hereditary occupation. Though that appears to be changing in recent times. This feature obviously applied consistently only to non-celibate branches of the priesthood. Individuals who successfully completed requisite initial training are ordained. Following general patterns similar to those of Buddhist monastic practice. Ordination requires a quorum of ordained priests, and the ordinand takes refuge in the Deo. The canon of scripture, and the tradition's spiritual teachers. Much as the Buddhist monk takes refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Lay specialists, whether black hats or red turbans. Apprentice to an authoritative master called a Daojang perhaps the equivalent of high priest. His task is to lead novices through several levels of ritual assistantship. Students begin with basic musical accompaniment. Learn to watch over the incense burners, and lead group prayers. More difficult training includes learning to chant and memorizing often intricate rubrics. Ritual Movements After learning to copy sacred texts and write talismans calligraphically, Aspirants are ready to lead ritual. In the People's Republic of China some seminaries still provide formal doctrinal instruction. But that is generally not the case in Taiwan. Formal ordination focuses on the symbolism of the master conferring. The seal of priesthood and the texts the specialist will follow. Some scholars suggest the training of black hats is more rigorous and literate than that of the red turbans. Who tend to serve less official, more popular functions and have much in common with the shamans of old. <laughs>